Yeah, you know, my 15 year old daughter is in that category. She wants to be an orthopedic surgeon and uh, she wants to operate on only elite female athletes. So I, I hear and see it in her every day. I think one of the first things you have to recognize is that you have to be about your mission, not just your major. So my undergrad students, I tell them, yes, you want to become a doctor, but what's your mission in life? Is your mission in life to make people better, to have them, you know, really get what they need? And if that's the case, then you've got to be excellent every day. And the second part is to really obsess about the journey of life. Hey guys, Dr. Dale here. Really quick before we start this episode, I want to ask you to support our mission by doing one thing. Just subscribe. Subscribe to our YouTube channel or our podcast channel, whichever one you listen to. Just hit that subscribe button. The way our podcasts get out there is by you guys liking it, by subscribing, and of course by sharing as well. So if you do one of those things for us right now, we really appreciate it. We work very hard to make these episodes for you guys. We work very hard to get them out for you guys and just to try to uplift the entire community. So if you can help us out by doing one of those things, subscribe, share, or like every time. Really appreciate it. Love you guys. What is up, family? My name is Dr. Dale. I'm the author of How to Make the Doctor Wizard Compared to Did, the author of Black Men and White Coast, the author of the Dr. Doc Children series, and the author of a new book that's coming out soon. And you're listening to the Black Men and White Coats podcast, where clinicians have the platform to share their stories with listeners like you. Today, I am super excited about this guest. Um, you guys have no idea I'm excited for the, for the sake that you guys get to hear it, but honestly, in a selfish way, I'm more excited for the sake that I get to talk to this man here on this call. Um, you know, just a giant in the field of medicine and the field of education, period. I'm not going to go into and tell you too much about him because I want you guys to hear it directly from him. But what I will say is he's the 17th president of Howard University. And most people, when I talk to them about this, this I'm going to call him a young gentleman <laughs> in, in a sense, and, I, and you'll understand why in a bit. Most people think that I'm talking about, oh, he's just with the medical school. No, not just the medical school. Like he is the guy, um, which, which is so amazing. So without further ado, Dr. Wayne Frederick, president of Howard University. Thank you so much for joining us on the Black Men and White Coast podcast. Welcome. Thanks for having me, Dr. Dale. I appreciate it. Now, so um, to the viewers, you guys behind the scenes, let me give you a peek and tell you why this is even more special. More important is um, as we're recording this, literally there's some crazy stuff going on across the country, it's February 1st, first day of Black History Month, and there have been some um, bomb threats at, at HBCUs across the country. So that's more reason why I'm just gonna say thank you one more time and extend the gratitude that you're taking this time to, to, to do this today. Yeah, no, thank you, my pleasure. It's an unfortunate incident, but I think part of what we have to continue to display is our resilience. And so that's why I'm here, I'm gonna keep showing up and uh, doing what we need to do to inspire our community. So I appreciate you having me. So, so um, I know your time is limited, so I want to get just directly into kind of your story, your life, because people need to hear this. I need to hear this for my own selfish reasons, but people need to hear this. Um, so originally from Trinidad and Tobago, is that correct? Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, that's correct. So tell, tell me what life was like for you as a child, as a youth, not knowing you're going to become this big time doctor. What was it like? What were the things that inspired you as that little five-year-old, you know, child growing up in Trinidad and Tobago? Sure. Well, you know, I was born in 1971, some 50 years ago. Um, and I mentioned that because it was about a year prior to my birth that the Trinidad and Tobago healthcare system started mandatory testing for sickle cell screening at, at birth. So my parents found out that I had sickle cell um, at birth and decided to stay close to the hospital for the first six months of my life. And then subsequently moved into the home that my parents still live in to, the, to this day. Around the age of three, I overheard my grandmother talking about my sickle cell to you know, some friends and I was asking her what it was about. She took the time to try to explain it to me. As she tells the story, I rode off on my tricycle and came back and said, you know, I'm gonna become a doctor to, to try to fix that. And my mom being a nurse, um, you know, I spent my, my childhood really immersed in reading a lot. Um, I was hospitalized fairly frequently as well, that, that was always a challenge, but my mom would sometimes change shifts or work a double shift to be in the hospital so she could, you know, kind of look over me as it were. And so it was, it, I would say it was an idyllic childhood from the point of view that I enjoyed um, a lot of uh, frivolity with, you know, kids in the neighborhood, um, parents exposing me to things, you know, taking me on foreign trips to other countries, um, primarily US, other Caribbean countries. And so, you know, that was um, 
it, it was helpful despite the fact that I was ill. I never felt um, that I could not dream big or, or reach for the stars as it were, you know. So that's, that, that, that's, that's amazing. So at the age of three, you come back and tell your grandmother that you're going to become a doctor because you want to take care of sickle cell. And to the listeners, sickle cell is, um, is, a, is a blood type of disorder. It deals with hemoglobin and um, the shape of your blood cells and different things can happen. You have a lot of pain crisis. So some of these patients will suffer from a lot of these painful episodes. Now, so as a child, did you have sickle cell crises? And, and you mentioned you had to you'd be in the hospital sometimes. The going to the hospital with sickle cell crisis, did, did that impact what you thought of medicine, how you wanted to be engaged with medicine, the type of doctor you wanted to be? Yeah, it, it most certainly did. You know, it didn't influence as much what type of doctor I wanted to be because I, I didn't think I had a broad enough understanding of the different fields of medicine. I knew I wanted to try to find a cure. I would practice my Nobel Prize speech, um, you know, as a kid. Okay. And, but what it did influence is the, how I... Uh, practice medicine. So when I go to see my patients, I sit in the room with them at eye level uh, because I remember as a kid having, you know, a physician stand at the foot of the bed overlooking you felt so intimidating. And I remember, you know, always wanted to go home. So waiting for the visit, for the doctor to come in and tell me I was okay to go home. You know, I'd be up early and then the doctor would come by. They'd be there for five minutes at the foot of the bed, speak amongst themselves and walk away and uh, I'd be heartbroken if I if I didn't hear I was going home. And so th- a lot of those things just, I, I got good care, don't get me wrong, but a lot of those things really influenced how I thought about how I wanted to practice medicine, the fact that I wanted to amplify people's humanity and I just respect it um, because I think it's a big difference. You, you can acknowledge someone's humanity and that's by taking good care of them, but you can really amplify it by trying to elevate uh, you know, their, their spirit, their dignity um, by simple things, you know, spending more time with them, sitting and speaking to them at eye level. And so uh, that was helpful. And then the other thing that was a big influence is my mom was a nurse, but she would also administer care to folks in the community. So they would sometimes come to our home um, mm-hmm. to have their bandages changed, et cetera. And I would stand there and assist her. And some of those wounds uh, weren't the prettiest, you know, and she would say to me, this doesn't make you ill, this, you know, and I would say to her, no, I was fascinated because I would see those wounds heal over time. And I would think to myself, wow, I mean, this, you know, medicine and the human body was just so amazing to me and trying, being able to get an opportunity to learn about that person was great. And then being hospitalized gave me a lot of time where, you know, I couldn't be out playing my favorite sports such as soccer and cricket and um, didn't learn to swim. Uh, so I spent a lot of time reading. I was fascinated by books and I mean, books of any kind not just to do with medicine, but uh, I was, a, you know, I would say I was a voracious reader as a, as a young kid. So, and, and, and that's going to play a huge part in, okay. So I know this because I've, I've studied you already, but at 16 years old, right. You make this transition to come to to the United States, how is that common in Trinidad and Tobago for people to be finishing up their, you know, their um, education and high school education at sixteen, or was that voracious reading? Did that set you on track to excel academically? Yeah, it, the, the reading definitely set me on track to, you know, I, I would say be really prepared academically. Um, high, this, the British system is a little different, so you start high school a little earlier. I started one year earlier than most people would in Trinidad and Tobago, so I started at the age of ten. Um, I skipped the equivalent of eighth grade here. And so I was actually finished with high school at the age of 14, but oh, wow. I could apply to school, but obviously having sickle cell, you know, at that age as well, um, our focus was on me doing more kind of pre-college courses. I did that for another two years. I was finished at 16 and um, applied and got into Howard at the age of 16 and then came here and joined Howard's um, BSMD program, which is a combined program, two years undergrad and four years medical school. So I, I definitely, academically, I would say was well prepared. Um, I could question whether I was mature to see the types of things I was going to see, but needed to learn to, uh, needed to mature very quickly living on your own at, at that young age. Amazing, amazing. So th- t- tell me this, do you remember what you wrote in your personal statement going to medical school? I'm yeah, not curious, I, 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 I would guess that it dealt with sickle cell, but I'm curious to know right. if this idea of who you've become was reflected in that right. personal statement back then. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I wrote about my sickle cell, but probably not for the reasons most people would think. You know, I wrote because it was a motivator to be, you know, to become a physician. My mom still doesn't like me here 
sis doesn't like to hear me say this. And she practiced uh, nursing for 50 years, but I, I refer to sickle cell as one of the greatest motivators in my life. And I, I was blessed in some way to have sickle cell because while it was a limitation on my mortality and definitely increased my mobility in terms of be, you know getting sick so often, et cetera, um, it motivated me in a way that I'm not sure anything else could have motivated me, you know, and, and that was a blessing in disguise. The other thing I did about my personal statement and why I wrote that and same thing for residency was I wanted full disclosure of who I was, you know, and what I was bringing to the table and the fact that I probably would get ill and it could hamper my education uh, in both stages. And um, that's why I think Howard is such an exceptional place because Howard took me in and gave me that opportunity. So I, I've still never met a board certified surgeon who has sickle cell. I'm homozygous for the disease. So I have two um, defective genes. Um, and I'm not an exceptional person, but Howard certainly is. And I think it created an opportunity for me that no other place in the world could have. So why is that? So so when you were leaving um, to come to the, the States, even Trinidad to be able to come to the States, um, was it going to be Howard and only Howard? Or did you look at maybe some PWI institutions? Uh, so what was it so much about Howard that you, you keep on referring to Howard being such a special place there? Yeah, I only applied to Howard. And how oh, it was wow. a special place because the first prime minister, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, was a political science professor here, Sir Eric Williams. Um, he was a graduate of Oxford University in England. Um, and he came to Howard as a political science professor and would refer to Howard as the Black Oxford, would return to Trinidad and Tobago and basically um, really free the country from colonialism, um, both as independence in 1962 and then subsequently um, had Trinidad and Tobago become a republic in 1976. And so Trinidad, as far as I was concerned, Trinidad and Tobago's connection to Howard was great. I mean, the physicians who delivered my younger brothers who were from Howard. I mean, Howard was everywhere and, and was everything in terms of the mecca of um, education. And so, you know, for me, um, it was the ultimate destination. And then even when I got here for undergrad and had the opportunity to apply to other medical schools, I only applied to Howard. Um, as well, because I felt it was important for me to stay in this system. Um, so what gave me so much opportunity. So had you not been accepted to Howard for whatever crazy reason, what would you have done then? Yeah, you know, I often think about that. Um, and I'd, I'd like to think I'm resilient. My first year of medical school here, I was offered a full scholarship to attend a medical school in Trinidad and Tobago. So, you know, I, I, I think I would have still pursued that path. Um, and not taking anything away from the education I would have received there, I'm not sure that I would have pursued surgery, for instance. And definitely, um, I probably would not have had the opportunity to do a surgical oncology fellowship at MD Anderson Cancer Center, which, in my opinion, at that time and still is probably the number one cancer center in the world. And so those opportunities probably wouldn't have been open to me. And certainly um, not becoming the president of you know, such a prestigious institution. So um you know, last year we released, we made a documentary, Black Men and White Coats documentary, and, and one of the individuals in it is Dr. Mark Nevay. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, if you guys, but that's probably DC, he was there. So that's Mark Nevay. Um, and one thing he says in the documentary, there's a clip where he says that um, he's originally from Trinidad and Tobago, grew, grew there, was there as a child. And when he came to the States, he had no inferiority complex. So he never felt as though there was nothing he couldn't do. He didn't have this imposter syndrome type of feeling things because he commented that as a child, he saw black people excelling all the time. So then he never thought about the fact that he couldn't do anything. Was that the same type of feeling you had? So when you got to the States, granted you're at HBCU, but when you got there, did you ever have any sort of inferiority complex, feel you couldn't do anything? Or did you come in knowing that, hey, you know, I can handle anything you, you throw at me? You know, I, I think confidence and not arrogance, but confidence in oneself comes from kind of two sources. One is that sometimes it can be out of ignorance. And I would say my growing up in Trinidad, it was probably more out of ignorance. I saw black physicians, I saw black nurses, you know, I, I saw a black prime minister. So I didn't, I didn't have an issue with whether or not people could do this. And that was more ignorance or, or the fact that people may be preventing you from getting there. When I got to Howard though, what Howard did was unleash the largest of my ambitions. Uh, so I think Trinidad and Tobago gave me the technical education and the foundation for, to build that confidence. 
but Howard did something different. Howard said, okay, that's great that, you know, you, you, you might be smart, et cetera, but it's not just about you. It's about truth and service. You're gonna come here and get the knowledge, but you owe the rest of the community a service. And therefore to do that, um, I'm the Charles R. Drew Professor of Surgery today, and, and this man used to say this all the time, which is excellence of performance will transcend all artificial barriers created by man. And so what I think Howard did was it set the bar in a different place. I think you could get comfort, you could get in a comfortable place when you're ignorant about what the forces against you are. But when you actually are in a circumstance where somebody says, listen, there are forces against you, you still are you know, very smart, but you've got to put the work in and really raise your bar to one of excellence and can't compromise. Every single day, you've got to bring that A game. And I think that's what Howard gave me. So by the time I was finished my residency and went to fellowship, while I was operating and amongst people who, you know, were from Ivy League schools and had probably done five times the number of operations I had done, et cetera, I, I felt very, very prepared, you know, to do what I needed to do. So it, it, both things, I, I would say my, my Howard experience just reinforced the foundation that I had, you know, coming here. And this is, so you, you go, come to Howard, you finish med school, you're 22 years old, all right? So you finish med school at 22 years old, you go through residency, um, at the current, and I'm going to backtrack and get to the point I'm getting to, the current state, you mentioned you're born in 71, so just barely over 15. You've been president for a while. So you were a crazy young, you know, president of a major institution, a, a world-renowned institution at a very young age. What led you down that path to, you know, you finish residency, you go to fellowship, all that. What led you down that path to say, I'm going to go get my MBA and become president because <laughs> that's, yeah. that's a huge jump. Most people never even think of that. Sure. You know, I've always been interested in academia because I think teaching and passing all knowledge that we have is one of the most important things we could do. And my mentor, Dr. LaFall, often used to say being a physician is the, one of the most noble things you could do and being a surgeon is probably the most noble of physicians. Uh, having said that, I recognized very early on that what he poured into me through that mentorship, I had a responsibility to pour into others. And he treated me almost like a son. And so the ability to do that on a large scale, recognizing that I myself would never find a cure for sickle cell, but I had an opportunity to lead an institution where a physician scientist may be, may be birthed, as it were, who could go out and find a cure is a really humbling experience. And being the president of, of this university in particular, because of its mission, is what gets you there. So I will admit that I'm a reluctant university president. I never once said that I wanted to be a president. Um, I was an associate dean for clinical affairs in a med school and went and got my MBA because of the financial aspects that I had to be really good at. And I always had a curiosity around finances. And it just would happen that, um, you know, I'd become the provost just a couple of years later. I was fine with that. And you know, suddenly uh, I got a call one day to be the interim president and then uh, got an approach to join the suit. So I have to admit, I didn't seriously think about the presidency until maybe, you know, 15 months before I actually became president, to be quite honest. And so that it wasn't a long term ambition. And I, again, I say that because that's the kind of place how it is. I think it prepares you for the things that you, you may think you're heading in a certain direction and you've kind of arrived at a certain destination, but it's a long journey that Howard prepares you for, and you have to be prepared to enjoy that journey and not be obsessed with any destination in particular. Yeah, that, and personally, my faith, I believe in the providence of God, and I believe uh, one of my mentors always tells me that if God's opening the doors, go through the doors. It sounds like you had some, some doors opening. Now, I know, so I'm going to respect time. We have about four or five minutes left, because even though I've got a whole list of questions I want to ask you, I know it's a crazy day for you. So what I want to get into is, is your um, advice. So a young Black I'm gonna say young black girl because people want to box us in and say we only do black men. But let's say a young black girl, mm -hmm. right, wants to be a doctor, having a hard time trying to figure out life. What is that one piece of advice you would say? Not even about being a doctor, but you know, I always tell people it's not about the white coat. I say, what is your white coat? Your white coat might be long, yeah. or whatever. What advice would you give her about greatness? Yeah, you know, my 15-year-old daughter is in that category. She wants to be an orthopedic surgeon and uh, she wants to operate on an only elite female athlete. So I, I hear and see it in her every day. I think one of the first things you have to recognize is that you have to be about your mission, not just your major. So my undergrad students, I tell them, yes, you want to become a doctor, but what's your mission in life? Is your mission in life to make people better, to have them 
you know, really get what they need. And if that's the case, then you've got to be excellent every day. And the second part is to really obsess about the journey of life. And I have dubbed that as well because I have sickle cell and I recognize that my mortality um, is always an issue for me. But I think anybody can apply that because if you obsess about the journey, you're going to get up every day, you're going to read, you're going to do the things you need to do. And more importantly, you're going to treat everybody in front of you in a way that you amplify their humanity. Sometimes we think that that means that you've got to go out and cure every poverty issue in the world and so on. But it, it just happens that you could do that with everybody that you meet. You smile and say some good morning to someone, make eye contact. You don't know that person is going to walk away and you would have just changed the course of their day. And I think if you do those things, that will lead to your being great at what you do, because I think the universe gives you back that in abundance uh, when you do those things. Amazing. I'm going to ask you two more quick, fun questions now. Um, kind of fun. The first one is, if it were not medicine, what would you be doing? Oh, I definitely want to be a, a, a soccer player, a pro soccer player. Uh, my best friend actually played professional soccer um, it, all the way uh, in England, Premier League and um, oh, wow. the MLS. And I'm a big soccer fan. So every Saturday morning, that's where you could find me in front of the telly uh, looking at English soccer. Oh, nice, nice. Excellent, excellent. I'm a basketball guy, but I, soccer was probably my first sport, but I'm a basketball guy. Yeah. Um, the second question is a little bit different question, but I think it's a fun question. Now, as, as a physician, not even a physician, you're a physician businessman leader, but as a physician businessman leader, thinking about arts, what artist would you compare yourself to and why? It could be a musician, it could be a painter. What artist would you compare yourself to and why? What's the similarity? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I, and one that I gotta, I gotta probably take a, a deep moment to think about. You know, the person that for some reason is flooding into my head is Stevie Wonder. Yep. And the reason I said that is because I think, you know, he overcame a challenge, but more importantly, you never hear him talk about it or use it as an excuse for anything that he wants to do. And I think what he's done is created absolutely um, fascinating, you know, music for others, despite the fact that you would think that he would need or want so much. And that's not how he has a put life or his uh, craft. And I like to think that despite my sickle cell, you know, I'm in the business of trying to make sure that I give for, to others as much as I could give. Excellent, excellent. So what I will say in um, closing, and I'll give you the last word, is you are, from what I hear, from what I've read, from what I know about you, you are the exact reason why we talk about we need more Black men and Black women and white coastal people from underrepresented backgrounds. Here you have an individual, you know, who's brilliant as a child, has sickle cell, suffers from something that the most majority of people in the United States don't suffer from, says, I want to solve this problem. You, you study, you work hard to become the individual you are intellectually, come to the States, do what you have to do, and you put yourself in a position where you can impact lives positively to alter the agenda that's currently there. Um, and had you not been an individual that has sickle cell, you might, not, you might have never done that. Um, so that's, if, if Nobody understands why we're so big on black men and white coats and unrepresented matter. They need to just look at your story. It's that exact reason you exemplify the 100% exemplify exactly why we talk about this. Um, no better example have I ever seen. This is the exact exact reason. Um, so I just want to say thank you for taking the time to be here on the podcast today, especially um, given the, the light of what's happening um, today. We really appreciate it. You know, I look up to you. A lot of people across the country look up to you. So thank you. And I want to give you the last word. Whatever you want to say, um, as long as it ends with these words. My name is Dr. Wayne Frederick, Frederick, and I am a black man in the white coat. I want to tell him with those words. Okay. All right, sure. Words. You know, I'll, I'll end by saying that I think the, the root to that uh, success, especially in medicine, is circuitous. And the disparities that exist in people's access to, click, to cure and how underrepresented minorities are means that we all have to pitch in. You know, I also have a 17-year-old son. I, about three or four months ago, I had the opportunity to bring both of them to the operating room for the first time. And while my son is committed to Duke uh, to play soccer, Division One soccer, um, I made that incision. He's going to be an economics and finance major. And when I made that incision and I look back at he and my daughter, I saw the same rush that I had um, in their eyes when I first got into medicine. So, you know, my advice to you is to, you know, keep pursuing that dream. We need more of you to do this. And uh, I also want to take the opportunity, Dr. Dale, to thank you for what you do because 
Uh, you've created a megaphone yourself. That's different than somebody giving you a megaphone, but you also have been using it uh, to amplify the humanity of so many young, you know, black men and, and women who need to have this opportunity. So I say to all of you, um, you know, obsess about that journey, uh, be excellent every day, but most importantly, be kind, amplify everybody else's humanity to sharing yours. I'm Dr. Wayne Frederick, and I'm a black man in a white coat. I want them bands like a dad, yeah. Only do it like flagger, yeah. I'm kicking flavor with no saga, yeah. Ayy, I like them blues. I might go Janet like Jackson. I got them options, yeah. It's all about progression. Life is like a blessing. Everything a win, loss is like a lesson. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, ain't no time for stressing. I've been really stepping. Ooh.